Rachel Notley is with us live now from Edmonton. Hi, Ms. Notley. Thanks for making the time. Thank you very much. It's good to be able to talk to you. I think we have a little bit of a delay, uh, delay in the connection, so I'll just warn our audience of that. I know that you had a lot of these today, so thanks for, for squeezing us in as well. I wanted to start off by asking if you knew after the last election that it wasn't a question of if, but more when you'd resign as leader. Uh, I wouldn't say it was right after the last election. It's a, it's a really important thing, I think, for every leader after an election to take stock and decide, uh, you know, what happened and what's likely to happen going forward and, and whether they're still in the right spot. And so I, I did give it, uh, you know, genuine, fair consideration um, after the election, but I, I will certainly also acknowledge that I made that decision um, before yesterday. Uh, and part of the reason that, that now is the time that I'm making my announcement is because, uh, you know, I, I was able to uh, successfully uh, help our fabulous, amazingly credible and capable uh, 19 new MLAs through their first session uh, this fall. Ultimately, when you were making those considerations, what distinguished what happened to your party after this election versus the loss to Jason Kenney? Like after you lost to Jason Kenney, you you didn't you know you didn't resign. You stayed on for another four years. What was the distinguishment between the two elections for you? Well, I think uh, really, you know, in 2019, there there was very quickly a narrative that developed that suggested that, you know, the NDP was done, and more importantly, that Alberta is a conservative province once again, and will be for another 40 years, and yada, yada, yada. And I found that, uh, you know, quite frustrating, and I also believe that it was very much not true. And, and so, and at the time, uh, you know, I believe that my... Uh, role in staying on uh, was was p a more important part of of contesting that overall um, narrative and assumption. Now, what's different is that yeah, of course, we didn't win the election in 2023. That's obvious, but we did grow the party uh, to a place where it is stronger than it ever has been before. Arguably, even stronger than we were uh, between 2015 and 2019. We have a caucus that I would argue is the most qualified and capable of any caucus sent to the Alberta legislature in uh, a one or two generations. And, uh, and, and the party's in good shape. Our relationships with uh, stakeholders and opinion leaders and community members all across this province is, is well developed. Uh, and, and so this is a, a good time for me to be able to go while leaving behind me uh, a, a political choice for Albertans, uh, not just for who will best articulate their vision in the legislature uh, as, a, as a voice in the wilderness, but rather who will be uh, the person that they can give their vote to with an expectation that they will govern the province. Can I interpret that in layman's terms that you feel as though the person who replaces <laughs> you has a better shot at doing that now than they might have after the, the, the other election? Well, you could. I mean, sure, I preferred to, <laughs> to take four times as long saying that. But uh, yeah, sure. Yeah, no, that's about <laughs> it. Actually, you got it. <laughs> uh, you said today also that the things you considered, uh, among the things you considered was that what would rather be in the best interest of your party? Why do you feel it's in the best interest of your party beyond their chances or their prospects for, for your replacement to not have you at the helm anymore? I mean, 10 years is a long time. You make an impression on the way a party works, the, the way in which it works in the legislature and in the public. Like, why is it in the best interest of the NDP to not have you at the helm? Well, because I think that because of the growth that we've experienced, uh, it, it is important uh, for that there be a time of renewal and that there be a time for for real conversation about uh, you know the next uh, you know the next few years for the party and what our focus will be and what the face of the party looks like and and so uh, you know uh, the people and provinces change in ten years and 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 provinces and and parties should probably you know make an effort to keep up every now and then and so you know I've been around for for a long time and and I'm very proud of the work that I've done but uh, I also appreciate uh, the need for for a bit of renewal every now and then and and as I say you know uh, politics is a bit of a tough go these days and I, I feel very privileged to be able to pick the time of my departure and I feel that that this is a good time because I'm leaving the party in good shape 
You also said during your press conference that you haven't decided beyond, you know, you're going to stay on until the, your replacement is chosen, but you haven't decided if you'll uh, stay on as an MLA thereafter. Why would you stay? Uh, well, you know, there's lots of things. I mean, I, I love my community. I will say, uh, you know, being a, an MLA uh, for the people of Edmonton Strathcona is actually a really fun job. Uh, and, uh, it, and I'm looking forward to the opportunity to spend more time doing just that. Uh, so there's, there's good reasons to do it. Uh, I'm a little young for retirement. And uh, so, you know, we'll see. But uh, honestly, at this point, what I'm really focused on is leading the caucus uh, through the, the next legislative session and then uh, being there for uh, the successful uh, leadership, uh, the successful leader after the process uh, and, and supporting them. And I know that that's where your focus is, but uh, we have an audience of, of a lot of Canadians across this country who will certainly be familiar with listening to your comments on, on federal politics. So I do have to ask, I'm sure they're, they're wondering as well, if you are considering a run federally at all. I listened to your interviews you conducted earlier today. You, you didn't sound like you'd ruled <laughs> it out, but I primarily want to know, do you consider yourself a federal New Democrat first? Well, you know, I am a federal New Democrat. There's no question about that. But I have no intention of running uh, federally for the NDP or obviously any other party. And and honestly, uh, I answered the, that question in a different interview uh, more recently just by saying, nope, not going to happen. I could answer the question in French, at which point you would realize that it could never happen. But either way, uh, yeah, no, it's 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 uh, not a thing that I plan to do. Although uh, I'm I'm proud to be a federal New Democrat. And just finally on the federal scene, uh, I, I you know most of the interviews we've conducted over the last few years have been about federal climate policy. And I just wanted to conclude by asking for your thoughts on something you championed years ago, uh, price on carbon, a carbon tax at the provincial level. You were supportive of the federal program when it was implemented. It has certainly evolved in both you know, scope and reaction over the last number of years. Are you still supportive of the program as it exists today? Well, as it exists today, it does seem to be starting to fall apart in a lot of different ways. And so that is a problem. I do think that efforts to combat climate change have to be equitably applied uh, across the country. And, and where there are greater consequences to those efforts uh, to uh, communities and economies, that, that that needs to be adjusted for. So is it still the best tool? I'm not 100% sure, but I will say this, Vashi. Uh, uh, this this, e this uh, uh, either or argument is very, very challenging for me. Climate change is real and smart, serious government works very, very hard to prepare the country, our, our respective provinces, our economy and, and our citizens uh, for how to uh, adjust to what is coming, to be resilient and if possible to grow the economy. Um, and, and the failure to do that, this zero-sum game that we seem to have fallen into is, uh, is not the right path uh, for this country. Uh, we can and need to do better. So let me ask you then, is it possible for a government to be serious about countering the impacts of climate change without a carbon tax? I think there are different ways to reduce emissions. You know, you can have just straight on caps there. Um, I will say, you know, honestly, the reason we looked at uh, the carbon tax back in the day in Alberta was because if, if not carefully managed, caps could turn into a transfer of wealth out of the province of Alberta. Uh, but there's a lot of different things that need to be done. Uh, you know, it's, it's, there's no simple solution. Uh, it does require resources. Uh, I've said before, and I'll say again, um, uh, not only Alberta, but Canada uh, uh, benefits a lot from uh, the export of non-renewable resources in, in this country. And uh, if we are going to uh, confront the, the issues of climate change, we need to find a way to do so uh, in a way that uh, we're able to position our energy industry to continue to contribute to our economy while at the same time uh, uh, significantly reducing emissions. And that works complex. It can be done, but we've, I, I am frustrated at, at the war of words that has interfered with real progress um, on, on these important goals. Okay, I'm out of time. I have to leave it there. Thanks for your time, Ms. Notley. Appreciate it very much.
Thank you.